Good morning, people. Uh, this is a sermon that will be posted on our Facebook page uh, on January 10, Sunday morning, January 10, 2021. Uh, we're going to continue here uh, virtually as I record these sermons and post them on Sunday mornings. Uh, the numbers for the coronavirus uh, are pretty strong. And we're going to continue this, at least for now. We will see what happens in the future. Well, I'm going to continue my series today in the book of uh, Ruth. Uh, title of today's message, Naomi Returns to Bethlehem with Ruth. The story goes on. We started this a couple weeks ago. I recorded a couple of sermons here in the book, an introductory message. And then last week, I... <clears throat> excuse me, looked at the first five verses that kind of set the stage how Elimelech and Naomi and the two sons left Israel, left Bethlehem and went to Moab. Uh, the father died, Elimelech died. Uh, the two boys married about 10 years later, the two boys died. And there is Naomi with two daughter-in-laws. So we're going to continue on with this. But first, uh, a bit of humor. I have started the practice of uh, always starting a message off here with some humor. So today's humor. Attending her first wedding, a little girl whispered to her mother, why is the bride dressed in all white? Because white symbolizes happiness. And today is the happiest day of her life, the mother replied. The little girl thought for a moment and then asked, so why is the groom wearing black? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he wasn't wearing white, was he? he? He had something different. Okay, let's get into our message for the day. Here's my outline. <clears throat> I try to break these verses down into uh, uh, an alliterated outline this week. I tried to do a alliteration here. We got Naomi's plans, verses six and seven. Naomi's plea, verses 8 through 13, she pleads with the two daughter-in-laws to go back to their family. Uh, point number three, Ruth's profession, verses 14 through 18, some well-known verses in there. Uh, point number four, Naomi's problem, verses 19 through 21. Uh, and then point number five, Naomi's position, where and when. Point number five, verse 22, kind of summarizes uh, the end of chapter one, the end of that section. All right, so let's get into this. Point number one, Naomi's plans. Here are verses six and seven from chapter one. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So interestingly, that she heard it out in the field. She uh, implied there she is out gleaning in the fields in Moab. And she heard from uh, people there, the Moabites that were there, maybe some that had been traveling and had come through the uh, Bethlehem area. She had heard that the Lord had visited the people that there was now crops and food. We had talked uh, last week about that the um, famine perhaps had come because of the Midianites and their uh, affliction on the people in uh, Israel. And uh, maybe Gideon had uh, already overthrown the Midianites and there was food again. So she sets out with her two daughters-in-law and they were going to head back to the land of Judah, as it mentions there. Some comments I made. As mentioned before, Bethlehem was about 40 to 50 miles away from Moab, simply going around. I got a map coming up, simply going around the Dead Sea. So the famine may have been caused by the Midianites during the time of Gideon. I had mentioned that last week. Now, Gideon may have 
may have freed the Israelites and there was grain again. Remember in Judges, Gideon was threshing his wheat in the wine press so the Midianites wouldn't find it. And then the Lord called Gideon and Gideon uh, was able to free Israel from the Midianites. And perhaps this is what happened. We don't know the exact time, but this is my thought of when the story of Naomi and Ruth takes place. And so anyway, um, Naomi had heard there was food back in Bethlehem again. This journey would have been very mountainous and very difficult for three women to make by themselves, it, though it was not that long. It was uh, through a mountainous area in Israel. Here we find a map of uh, Naomi's trip to and from uh, Moab. You see, they started off in Bethlehem and they simply went around the Dead Sea. Moab was down there in the uh, lower right part of the Dead Sea, uh, to the east of the Dead Sea. And when she's heading back, she's simply going to go back up uh, around the Dead Sea, uh, back over to Bethlehem. Okay, Naomi's plea. Okay, so they've started off. All of a sudden, Naomi stops. Verses, verses 8 through 13. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Talking about her two sons and with the mother-in-law. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. There was a strong relationship there between the daughter-in-laws and Naomi. They loved her. And now Naomi, as they had started on the way, all of a sudden Naomi stops and says to them, no, you two need to go back to your own house. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. That's what they initially said. And now here's her, her reasoning, what she said. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? She is referring to, and this becomes a major part in the book of Ruth. She refers to the, uh, in the Israelite law, there was a Liverite marriage. I have a verse coming up that will show that. Um, that would be if a brother dies and childless, that his brother is to take the wife and to bear a child, and that child would actually be uh, the first husband's, uh, considered by the law, the first husband's wife, uh, child. So here Naomi is saying, here I'm getting to be an elderly lady, I don't have a husband, and you think I'm going to have sons that are 20 years younger and going to grow up? Are you going to wait that long until they become marrying age? He says, turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, this last phrase in 13 shows that when she gets back to Bethlehem, it's really going to, to show forth. Naomi was blaming the Lord for her, her rough circumstances that she was in. She had become bitter. Uh, last week, we talked about going through grief and allowing the Lord to comfort us in grief. She had gone through great grief. She lost her husband, lost her two sons. And now it had turned into bitterness. The Lord has gone out against me, she says to her daughter-in-laws. So she wants them to go back. She feels, this is, a, uh, this is a statement of love on her part. She feels her daughter-in-laws would have a better life, go back to their own home, marry a new Moabite husband, and uh, have kids from them, and have a nice family uh, back home in Moab. So some comments here. Naomi refers to the Liberite marriage in the law of Israel. 
The right marriage is a type of marriage in which the brother of a deceased man is obliged to marry his brother's widow. The term liverite is derived from the Latin term levier, meaning husband's brother. Huh? How about that? The husband's brother, the levier. Uh, he is to marry the widow. The Israelite law says if a man dies without a child, his brother or closest redeemer relative, we find that when they do get back to, to Bethlehem, um, there is not a brother to marry Ruth, but there are some close relatives. Uh, the closest redeemer relative was to marry the wife and raise a child for him, for the dead, the passed away husband. Naomi says she is too old to ever have another uh, male child and the time for him uh, to grow to marrying age. So she implores, she pleads. There's my P in my um, outline. Naomi's plea was she pleaded with them to go back to their families and live there in Moab. Remarry, have a nice family uh, in Moab. This is a cross-reference about that. Deuteronomy chapter five, 25. You remember Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy, uh, the second law is what the name of that book says, and it restates the law that uh, Moses had gotten in Leviticus and in Numbers. Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6 says this. If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother, there it is, her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of the dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So that first son was going to be considered, you know, from the original husband uh, and grow up uh, with that inheritance and with uh, that life. This is going to play quite a role in the book of Ruth, uh, as we will see in the coming chapters. Okay, point number three, Ruth's profession, verses 14 through 18. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. This was a sad situation. Naomi is telling them to go back. They would be departing from one another. And Orpah, that was the, the first son's wife, kissed her mother-in-law signifying, okay, I'm going to leave you. This, the kiss was going to be a departing uh, symbol. So Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Ruth didn't kiss her. Ruth hugged her, clung to her robe. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Isn't that interesting? To her people and to her gods, the idols that the Moabites had worshipped. Return after your sister-in-law. So the first one, Orpah, left and went back, saw logic in uh, Ruth, in uh, Naomi's uh, arguments there. But Ruth wasn't going to. Ruth clung to her. And Naomi is pleading here with her. Uh, to go back to her people and to her gods, but Ruth is going to have any part of it. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God, that is a very important statement, probably one of the most well-known verses uh, from the book of Ruth. Let me read that again. Verse 16, and Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, Jehovah God, whom you worship, 
I'm going to set aside any Moabite idols, Moabite gods that my family had, uh, had me worship as a child, and I'm going to accept the Lord, Jehovah God, the God of Israel, to be my God. Verse 17, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord, there's that term, the Jehovah God, Yahweh, may the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death departs me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined, Ruth had made up her mind, she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Well, okay, Ruth. Uh, it's going to be a rough go. You can come back with me. So some comments. Orpah saw the logic in, of Naomi and returned to her family. Maybe to remarry someone else and have children from another man. But Ruth stayed with Naomi and proclaimed that she would accept all of Naomi's life. Uh, her friends, her family, her her God, her people, the laws of Israel included was Ruth's expression that Naomi's God would become her God. Yeah, she was accepting the Israelite God as her own. She placed her faith in the true God of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, uh, God had chosen Israel to be a very special people for him. Uh, it wasn't until the New Testament time, the book of Acts, that the gospel went out to the Gentiles. But we do find a number, a handful of Gentiles who came into Israel and accepted uh, the Lord as their God. For example, one of them is going to be Rahab. Rahab is Boaz's mother. We're going to see that in chapters to come. She was... Uh, a, a Canaanite, uh, and she accepted um, when they when they came in to um, tear down and conquer Jericho. She accepted the Israelites' God as her God and became a um, a Jewish mom and accepted Israel, accepted the Lord as her God. Now we're seeing the same thing here with Ruth, a Gentile. Um, accepting Naomi's God as her own God, the true God of Israel. By the way, yeah, I bring this up. Verse 16, I think verse 16 and part of 17, is often used in a marriage ceremony of a wife's loyalty to her husband. Though the context is of a daughter-in-law toward her mother-in-law, the statement is very applicable toward a husband and wife. Some have criticized that because they say, well, if you take, you're taking it out of context because that was a daughter-in-law talking about her loyalty to her uh, mother-in-law. But it, the statement certainly is applicable. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. And then here's where the statement usually starts. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. When it's used in the marriage ceremony, it's uh, recognizing the husband as the head of the home and the loyalty and the faithfulness that a wife will have towards him. Uh, how were people saved in the Old Testament? Uh, it is often stated that in the Old Testament, they were saved by works, obeying the law. In the New Testament, they were saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. That statement is not true. People in the Old Testament were saved in exactly the same way that the people in the New Testament are saved. They get saved by trusting in the Lord. Uh, in Romans 4, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that the Old Testament way of salvation was the same as the New Testament way, which is by grace alone through faith uh, in Christ alone. Though in the Old Testament, they did not have the full revelation of who Jesus Christ was, they were to trust in what God had told them. To prove this, Paul points us to Abraham. 
who was saved by faith. Abraham believed Romans 4, 3. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is kind of an important verse because Paul bases the whole doctrine of justification by faith on this verse that Abraham believed God and he was justified. It was credited to him as righteousness. Again, Paul quotes the Old Testament to prove his point. Genesis 15, 6 this time. Abraham could not have been saved by keeping the law because he lived 400 years before the law was even given to Moses. Okay? Paul then shows that David was also saved by faith. Romans 4, verses 6 through 8, quote Psalm 32. Paul continues to establish that the Old Testament way of salvation was through faith alone. In other words, righteousness is credited credited or given to those who have faith in God. Abraham, David, and all believers in the New Testament, we share the same way of salvation. Paul bases this on these two Old Testament characters. Let me state it again. Book of Romans, a very doctrinal book where Paul explains salvation. He explains how we are saved, how our sins are forgiven, how we are looked at by God. We are credited with righteousness because we have faith in God. Paul bases this on Abraham and David, two Old Testament characters. Ruth, a Moabitess, not a Jew, Put her faith in Naomi's God. Ruth was saved by grace through faith. And by the way, as we will see, was included in the lineage uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cross-reference, Ruth 2.12. Boaz, now we're going to get into next week's message. But here Boaz says of Ruth when he finds her out in the field, and is introduced to her for the first time. You got to remember, um, and we're going to talk about this uh, in further messages, but Bethlehem was a little town. Everybody knew everyone. Everybody knew what was going on. They all talked about it. So Boaz had heard about Ruth. Listen to what Boaz says about Ruth. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord the God of Israel, notice what he says, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth had said to Naomi, I want your God as my God. Boaz says, Ruth was coming under the wings, the protective wings of the Jewish God, the Lord God of Israel, the one and true God. Not She was rejecting her Moabite idols, and had come to accept the Lord as her God, placed her faith in God, and it was credited to her as righteousness. Point number four, Naomi's problem, verses 19 through 21. Okay, she gets back to Bethlehem. As I had mentioned, Bethlehem was a little town. Everybody knew everybody. And the ladies here in Bethlehem, they all remembered Naomi from years past. Remember, 10 years had gone by since Elimelech and Naomi and the two sons had left Bethlehem. And now Naomi comes back. So the two of them went out until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of that. Like I said, a little town, everybody knew everyone here, these strangers come back, and it wasn't a stranger, it was somebody they knew from years ago. And the women said, is this Naomi? Now, notice Naomi's statement. Naomi had a problem. She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. The Hebrew word, I'm going to explain this, but the Hebrew word for bitter was Mara. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full. The Lord has brought me back empty. 
Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So she is uh, ex expressing here uh, a spiritual problem that she had. Of course, she went through a lot of grief, a lot of heartache. Both her husband and her two sons had passed away. And now she is coming back, a poor lady, a, a dependent daughter-in-law. And she felt that the Lord had brought calamity upon her. And she said, don't call me Mara or Naomi, call me bitter. I am bitter against the Lord, she said. Naomi's name. Naomi, and here's the Hebrew letters for it, is a feminine Jewish name of Hebrew origin. In Hebrew, it means pleasantness. So her name, she was as a child, she was named Pleasant, maybe even as a baby. Her parents saw that she had a very pleasant personality, and perhaps all of her life she had been a very pleasant person. But now, verse 4 said that they were gone for about 10 years. As she arrives back in her old hometown, the people were calling her Pleasant. Oh, look, at Naomi is back. We remember you, that very pleasant lady who left 10 years ago with her husband. But she did not want to be called Pleasant. She wanted to be called Mara. Mara meant bitterness. She felt that the Lord had treated her wrongly and had become, and she had become bitter about what the Lord had done to her. She did not feel that the Lord had treated her fairly, and she had bitterness growing in her life. Now, I'm going to mention, uh, I don't want to steal my thunder from several weeks down the road, but the Lord's going to take care of this, and she will realize in the future that the Lord is not unfair, that she need not be bitter towards the Lord. Here's a cross-reference in the New Testament, bitterness. Perhaps in your life, people, something has happened, and you became angry about it. It hurt you deeply, and notice this verse, Hebrews 12, verse 15. See to it. The author of Hebrews says that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Isn't this an interesting verse? Notice the analogy, a root of bitterness. What does a root do? Well, a root is in the ground, and it begins to grow, and it begins to grow, and it it grows both down where it becomes stronger and it, it becomes uh, entrenched and it grows up and pretty soon it breaks the surface of the soil and becomes manifest as a plant that grows. The author of Hebrews says we as believers, if we feel God has treated us unfairly or we have been hurt, we can allow, allow a root of bitterness to spring up and it will cause a lot of problems in our Christian life. This is taken from a, uh, a biblical counseling site. Uh, biblicalcounselingcoalition.org. Uh, I quote the next couple of slides from them. Naomi blamed God for making her life bitter and empty. All she could see was that she no longer had what she loved. Her bitterness reflected a heart of unbelief in the justice and sovereignty of God. God, you are not just anymore. I don't, you, you are treating me unfairly. She held on to the anger for what had been done to her and stood in judgment over God. In the entire text, we see nothing of Naomi's quest to understand the purpose of God in her suffering. We only read that she was angry and bitter for what she had lost. Continuing on from this site, perhaps you struggle with the same type of bitterness. You become bitter out of a belief that God it will not 
punish the people who hurt you, that God does not hear your plea, and that he does not care about your plight. That's what causes bitterness in our lives. It becomes a circular pattern. The more you dwell on what has been done to you, the injustice you have suffered or the loss you have incurred, <coughs> the deeper goes the root of bitterness. That's what roots do. They grow. So the more you dwell on it, the more you say God has been unjust, the more the root of bitterness will grow in your life. And then they bring out this point. Bitterness hardens your heart on the inside and your features on the outside. Notice this, it also defiles those around you because it is contagious. If you begin to talk about how unjust and unfair the Lord is, others will be affected by that in their own attitude. We need to be careful that a root of bitterness does not spring up in our lives. <laughs> I say here, Naomi's short-sightedness. Let me jump to the end of the book of Ruth. God proves himself, Ruth chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Then the women said to Naomi, it's, it's interesting, I kind of smile. Again, Bethlehem was a small town. Everybody knew everybody. Naomi's friends here, they were so happy that Ruth and Boaz had this new child they said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher in your old, of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became her, his, his nurse. Yeah, here we here we find that Ruth sees finally that the Lord uh, was giving her this this daughter-in-law and this new grandchild was better to her than seven sons. The Lord proves Himself in the end. Okay, point number five, Naomi's position. So this is this verse, verse 22, kind of summarizes what's going on. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now, it tells where they returned, but it also tells when they returned, and that's kind of an important an important part of this whole story. It was at the beginning of the barley harvest that they came back. Comments. Obviously, this is a summary verse. It summarizes what has happened. Naomi and Ruth have returned to Bethlehem. The closing reference to the time is important, as I said. It was the start of barley harvest, and the barley harvest is going to play an important role in, in the story of Ruth and Boaz. This harvest, which is in Israel, takes place in the month of April, is the beginning of the spring harvest. Immediately following that is the wheat harvest, and there's great celebration. Some of their holidays, their holy days, uh, come with these harvests where they offer to the Lord the first fruits. When the Israelites celebrated the year's first fruits, they were offering the first of their barley, in this case, to the Lord. From a physical standpoint, this was the perfect time for Naomi and Ruth to return to Bethlehem. Remember when they left, there was no food. And now when they come back, there is an abundance of food. It was a time of drought and lack of harvest that drove Naomi and her family to the land of Moab. Now at the time of hope of abundant harvest, they return. All right, here's the conclusion. This is a significant passage in the book of Ruth. It, it really sets the stage. We find an Old Testament salvation of uh, Moabite Ruth coming to the Lord. She accepted Naomi's God as her God, trusted in the God of Israel. But we also find a woman who is filled with bitterness towards the Lord because of the circumstances of her life. She felt the Lord had dealt unfairly with her. She was short-sighted, and in the end, she sees that the Lord was good. 
the end of the book will resolve this. The end of Naomi's life is better for her than first. If you are bitter towards the Lord, trust. There's the word. Trust that in the end, God's justice and God's goodness will prevail. All right. Let's close our message today in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are just. Thank you that you impute your righteousness to us by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that even though we may go through hard times, you have purposes for these hard times. May we not become bitter. May we not allow a root to take uh, hold in our lives, but may we trust in your goodness and in your justice. Bless this message to our lives, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.